or speak, God, <laughs> thy servant listens. That's where I got the idea for Evotional to call it just speak, God, because when he speaks, we should listen. Don't you think so? <laughs> I do. Because these threads sometimes long, it's hard to get them in. So sometimes I cut them short, sometimes I go as whatever the Lord would say to us and share for what we need to hear, for what we need to understand, to apply to our own life, and what he would be speaking as though he were sitting here, because whether you know it or not, <laughs> he is. When you're tempted, have you found yourself in a situation where you wanted to take the wrong way out? Maybe you're weary of the battle, exhausted from trying to do what is right. Or maybe you feel that no matter how obedient you are, it won't change things anyways. Maybe you just want to have your own way, like a child throwing a temper tantrum. My way. I did it my way. Or having things gotten so bad that you simply want to check out. By that I mean giving up in despair and letting your emotions and thoughts run amok any which way they want to, rather than allowing the Spirit of God to tell you to keep them under His control, your thoughts. Believe me, if you are dealing with any of these temptations, you're not alone. The question is, how are you dealing with them? Many who name the name of Christ choose their own way out of trials and temptations rather than God's way. Our mail at Precept Ministries constantly testifies to this and confirms what awful wreckage and destruction the flesh leaves in the aftermath of having its own way. And although me, you may know how to handle the flesh connection in trials where yielding to temptation is an ever-present option, I want to share some things that might help you in ministering to your family and to others who may suffer the consequences of your sin. Let me share just part of one of the thousands of letters we received crying out for help. This one was sent anonymously as a result of one of our radio broadcasts. How can I live, Kay? I was a virgin bride years ago. My husband tells me how sweet, precious, and pure I am. I want to vomit. It's not a compliment when it's a lie. I committed adultery, but he doesn't know that. I'm guilty, though God has forgiven me. I still hurt. My mind is like scrambled eggs, and I wonder if I'll ever sort it out again. I wonder if I'll ever stop loving the other man. Will I ever forget his touch, the memories, and the shame and guilt? Warn your listeners that what they think is unbelievable will become reality if they dwell on it. I don't know where it began for me, probably just a thought. My lover had a dream about me a year ago and confessed he dwelt on it till he made it come true. Elsewhere in the letter, the woman says her former lover was her pastor. Where does sin begin? The book of James gives us the answer. In the first 12 verses, James talks of trials, the reason God allows them and how we are to handle them. He then closes with the confirmation of God's blessing upon those who persevere rather than taking their own way of escape. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them who love him. James 1.12 Knowing that some would excuse their lack of perseverance by blaming God for placing the trial and the temptation in their way, James assures us that when we are tempted, we cannot blame God. Listen to what he says about this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. For each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, when lust has conceived, and you have done the action, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. James 1, 13 through 17. If we think the source, the hotbed of all temptation is God, then we're deceived. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt us. This is the first thing God wants us to understand. He himself, because he is God, altogether holy and other than man, would not tempt us to do evil. As a matter of fact, your sovereign God promises us this. No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 this, beloved, is your assurance that God will never permit anything to come to you your way or you cannot handle. Whatever the trial, testing, or temptation, 
but that is what the Greek word perisimos translated temptation means you can know that if it were not possible for you to endure it in a way pleasing to your Heavenly Father he would not permit it second God wants you to realize that the temptation does not come from without but from within on, oh, the opportunity to sin is always there, but we live in a world that has been invaded by the evil one, Satan himself. However, it is not the world nor the devil which causes you to be tempted. It is your own flesh, you. What a difference it makes to realize this, for all of a sudden you see your total accountability in this day and age that is something few want to acknowledge. Accountability because they say that they are being tempted by the devil and have powers and forces and evils that are in the world when in reality it's their own flesh that gives in. Temptation comes when you are enticed by your own lust. The word for lust is epithemia in the Greek, which means a strong desire of any kind. It can be a good desire, it could be a bad desire, depending upon the context in which it is used. The word enticed is from a Greek hunting and fishing term meaning to catch in a snare or trap or to lure a fish from behind a rock. James is very clear. It's your own lust, your own desires that would trap us and to lure you away from God, the rock. Deuteronomy 32.4 Every desire must be acted upon. It must be denied or fulfilled. It is a matter of choice. It's a matter of your choice and mine. But if a wrong desire is fulfilled, God says that it will bring forth sin, and that sin will bring forth death because the sin destroys anything in its path and everything it touches. That death can take many forms. The death of innocence, the death of opportunity to serve God, the death of purity, the death of a relationship. Sin is a child of desire. Therefore, you need to recognize your desires for what they are. If you rationalize them and accommodate them, you will find yourself in sin. And sin child is always named death. Sin is always the indication of an individual's choice and responsibility. Therefore, I urge you to remember and practice the following. Realize you are never above temptation because it is your own lust, your own flesh, your old man, which entices you, and you will have to live with that flesh until the day you die or until the Lord returns. Two, flee from lust. In the power of the Spirit, get out of there fast and get away. 2 Timothy 2.22 be careful about the company you keep, for bad company corrupts good morals, 1 Corinthians 15.33. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, 2 Timothy 2.22. Acknowledge that in your flesh there dwells no good thing, and keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation, remembering that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, Matthew 26.41, and Romans 7.18 and Matthew 6.13. Set your affections on things above. Keep eternity before your eyes. Pleasing God is all that is going to matter in the long run. When you despair in your trial and want to take your own way out, when you long to give up righteousness as a lost cause, when you weary of the pleading of the flesh and want to give in, when you want to let your mind and emotions stampede out of the barn and over the fence of its truths, don't be enticed by your desires, for they will only bring sin and death. Being one that has seen the marvelous things that God has done in my life, I've experienced miracles, I've experienced grace, <laughs> I've experienced mercy, I've experienced healing people and not having them healed, I've seen all ups and downs and sideways and lefts and rights and you name it. But likewise, I've also seen in my own self the very sins that we could describe among other men and women and everyone. I mean, there's... I can't think of any sin that I haven't thought of or committed. So I am fully aware that as spoiled a baby Christian as I was, I, more than anyone else, say to most of everyone that I know that I am the chiefest of sinners. I was given all the glory to begin with and had such marvelous enablings and powers and abilities from God without ever knowing what they were. And yet, I went off on my own way at times. Was I forgiven still? Yes. Did I bring God with me? Yes. Was God there? Yes. Did I learn? Yes. But did I repeat the error of my ways? Yes. And so to you. So, the best thing I can tell you is this. 
you can't frustrate grace, but you can cross a line at some place where you don't want to go. So choose now to recognize that yes, you live in a body of sin, and you will sin. A righteous man falleth down seven times and rises up again, but you can fall down and not sin, or you could fall down and dwell in sin. But if you were found living in sin at the end of your life, I dare say that God might question where you are and what you're doing. And that's between you and Him. But you can find that even though we sin, if we know that we are forgiven, we can ask for forgiveness. For if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can be made pure as snow, white, pure, but you got to get your mind in control because you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tried and you're going to be tested. And when you sin, if you, if you miss out on this testing to become stronger, when you sin, the reality is you did it. No one else. It wasn't the devil. It wasn't a spiritual attack. It wasn't God. It was you. Your flesh, your choice, your direction, you could have said no but you chose to sin. And that's the reality. We have to choose one way or the other. In every temptation, you've got one or two choices. You can either find that way of escape, which is to turn to God and ask Him for His help, or you could try to bear it yourself and you'll wind up sinning because it is bigger than you are and it will bring you down because you're living in a body of flesh and until you're perfected, you only are holy on the inside, not on the outside. How do I know? <laughs> because I'm exactly like you.